Um, just a little bit of admin before I get started here. I'm going to be playing some video clips throughout this presentation, just like I did in the previous one. Uh, but this presentation is, let's say, PG-13. Okay. Uh, there's some things that may not be appropriate for younger audiences in here. All right. So just to get that out of the way, because this is what I'm going to be talking about today. I call it a seed war, the beast, a strong delusion, and a most peculiar timeline. And we're going to go right back to Genesis 3. We did a lot of um, looking into Genesis 1 yesterday. Of course, you know, Genesis 2, Adam and Eve, they're put in the garden and all that. And we get to Genesis 3, and the serpent shows up. And it says, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Right? And that's when sin entered the picture. And this is the beginning of a seed war right here. We see in verse 15, where God says, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise or crush thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Getting your head crushed is a bad thing, don't you think? So what do you think the devil is going to do? If you're receiving that prophecy, her seed is going to crush your head. What do you think you're going to do to her seed? Try to get rid of it as soon as you can. And that's what you see right away. You, you get the, the bad one kills the good one, right? Cain kills his brother Abel. Then you turn the page or two, and you have what I call plan B, where we see this creature show up called the Nephilim. Enter the Nephilim. This is one of those subjects um, that used to trip me up, quite frankly, because I didn't understand what was going on in Genesis 6. Furthermore, I didn't really understand what was going on in the whole Old Testament because I had sort of this good cop, bad cop mentality when I looked at the scriptures. Because you have Jesus saying, you know, I and my Father are one, right? And uh, Philip says, you show us the Father and it'll be sufficient. And he's like, what? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. That never computed in my head. Uh, as a kid, I used to have those one-year Bibles. You guys remember those Bibles that were, the whole Bible was divided up into daily readings? I used to do those. And after doing a few of, uh, cycles of that, I thought, you know, what? I'm going to take, I'm going to create a notebook, and I've got a lot of questions. So I'm just going to this year, I'm just going to write all the questions I have. I'm not going to try to answer them. I'm just going to write the questions, and then and next year I'll go back and try to answer. You know, it, you know, a lot of times when you read through scripture, scripture interprets itself, and so you get the answers. Um, but I, I still couldn't get very far because I, you run into all these passages in the Old Testament specifically, where you got God saying, you know, kill the women, kill the children, wipe out the animals, kill everything. Utterly destroy, he would say. And these are just a few scriptures. There are lots of them where he's saying, go over there and utterly destroy everything. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Yeshua said, I, I and my father are one. If you see me, you've seen the father. Hebrews said that Yeshua is the expressed image of the father. So what's going on here? Because you got Yeshua is this amazing, loving guy, right? I mean, he even hangs out with publicans and sinners, and the only people he's having issues with and judging are the religious people, right? And yet, his father's over there wiping out everything, and I just couldn't reconcile that. And I would say that this, among other subjects that I've talked about this weekend so far, and will talk about, are some of the things that drive people into atheism. These are the main issues they have. The so-called, have you ever heard the phrase, the God of the Old Testament? Now, we understand that the old and new, it's the same. It's one big story, right? But, and, and the other thing that I have found is that, at least in my experience, the atheists that I have encountered, and I've encountered many of them, is that they tend to know the Bible better than most Christians I know. And that's part of the reason why they became atheists. Is because they know these scriptures. They don't know what, how to reconcile them. They don't know what they mean, but they can point every quote-unquote inconsistency that they perceive to be there. They know book, chapter, and verse. You know, a lot of Christians that don't know their Bible as well are tripping up all over the place, stumbling all over their face, trying to deal with, you know, the accusations that are coming their way. And then you combine that with these kids, you know, that grow up in the Christian church, and you have, you've got guys like Kent Hovind who will tell you the statistics of children who grow up in Christian families, grow up, you know, accepting Christ at a young age, in church every time the doors are open, reading their Bibles every year, go to secular high school or college, and within a year or two, they're dumping all of it. But then when you come along and show them, okay, but this is what the Bible is really saying, this is what it's really talking about, this is the reason why God's saying kill the women, kill the children, and everything like that, boom, all of a sudden that roadblock 
that caused them to deviate and go down the path of atheism has been removed. And in my experience, not only do they come back, they come running back with fire and zeal. That's been my experience. I, don't, I can't speak for anybody else. But so Genesis 6, for me, you know, I didn't really understand it. I, I accepted it as giants and that angels did it. Now, seminaries today teach what's called the Sethite theory. How many of you have heard that? That the sons of God in Genesis 6 are the good sons of Seth and the daughters of men are the bad daughters of Cain. Question, does it say that? It absolutely does not say that. Uh, and so because of that, they have no real answer for these questions, for, for these scriptures. They have no way to describe where the giants come from. And I don't care how much spinach you feed these people, kissing cousins are not going to produce Olga Bashan. All right? 15 footers, and he's a short guy. You know, you get to Amos 2.9, and the Amorites are described as tall as cedar trees. A modest cedar tree gets to 36 feet, 36 feet tall. The cedars of Lebanon were 150 feet tall, so I don't know the context in which Amos is writing. That's still huge. On the drive down here, there's a big statue of Sam Houston. Have you guys ever seen that statue on the highway? That's got to be close to that height. And I just, you know, it's this big white statue of Sam Houston on the side of the road. I'm like, wow, that's probably what they encountered when they went into the land of Numbers 13. And the good sons of Seth mating with the bad daughters of Cain does not answer that situation. And by the way, if it's supposedly the good sons of Seth, why are they the ones doing the bad thing in the story? It's just something to think about. Um, many of you know that I served in the military. I was in the Army, 1st to 110th Air Cav, 86 to 93. And I uh, was initially a helicopter mechanic slash door gunner and then became a, a pilot, scout helicopters. And in the military, I don't care which branch you go into, you have, you know, we called this our smart book. It's your common soldier's task book. And in that book, you learn that a soldier must know their chain of command. They must know their common tasks. You know, you have to be able to set up a tent, you know, and do all kinds of, you know, basic things. Uh, know your equipment. They used to say, you have to be smarter than the equipment you're operating, which means if you're going to drive a truck, you better be smarter than the truck. <laughs> you know, uh, you got to know your equipment inside and out. And, you know, with your weapons and stuff like that, you got to be able to take the weapons apart, blindfolded, put them back together again, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, of course, know your military's tactics. Know how your military moves forces and whatnot. After the, you get the basics down, and that's just the basics, after you get that down, you spend the rest of your military career getting to know your enemy. You do flashcard drills and stuff. And I, 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 I took it out of this presentation just because as I wanted the limited uh, the amount of time that I would spend. If you've ever seen my Mount Hermon Roswell presentation, I go through this in a little bit more detail in kind of a comical way talking about uh, identifying helicopters and stuff, and uh, a Russian helicopter that showed up in Plano, Texas, and my training kicked in. <laughs> I was about to go Wolverine on that deal, but uh, because I spent so much of my career doing threat identification, where you would study silhouettes, where you would study nomenclature, where you would know every detail about the enemies, because you got to know which one to shoot at. You know, obviously the one shooting at you is a good indicator, but there may be other situations, you know. <laughs> Uh, so you got to know your enemy. Uh, so I was talking with somebody in the back back there about the book, uh, um, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And it goes through all of that kind of stuff. You got to know your enemy. And we have an enemy. Don't you know that? We have an enemy, right? Yeah, we do. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's that's a really sobering scripture right there, if you really let that sink in. How many of you remember the book, This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti? Wow, what an amazing book. That was one of the first books that I read from cover to cover in one night. You know, like the first three or four chapters are kind of boring, but then all of a sudden he like opens up the veil so you can see what's going on in the spiritual realm. I'm like, whoa, this is cool. Uh, then I got it in uh, the audio version of it, and it, he, Frank Freddy was doing the reading of his book when he did all the character voices and stuff. Really wild, but it opened my mind to the spiritual war that we are in that's taking place all around us. And this is another really sobering scripture right here. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Have you ever read the book... Uh, the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. 
where was the primary place he, his junior demon that was in training, where was the primary place he wanted to set up shop? In the church. That's right. In the church. We'd be hopelessly naive to think that that wouldn't be where Satan would set up shop. Because it's the first things he does, right? When he shows him in the garden, yea, hath God really said? Right? He knows the word of God. He twists it and distorts it, but he knows it. And so it should be no surprise to us then that people are going to show up with all the appearance of servants of righteousness, and really they're working for the other side. And I'm going to submit that goes for astronauts too. Oh, he's a Christian astronaut. You dare question his testimony? Yeah. If he brings back a rock that claims that this place is 4.6 billion years old, yes, I will question him. I don't care if he's part of a creation ministry. Because, yeah, he claims to be a Christian, and maybe he is. That's not for me to judge. But does it just so happen to be this guy's A, a Freemason, card-carrying, and B, is the guy that just so happened to discover the Genesis rock that just so happens to refute Genesis? Yeah, I'm going to question him. And any others like him? I suggest that you start doing the same. Same with politicians. Fallen angels. How many angels, quote-unquote, fell with Lucifer? Okay, we're taught one-third, right? 33.3%, et cetera. Uh, now, how much do we really know about this one-third of the angels, and uh, who were they? What did they do? Well, we get a little bit of detail throughout the canonized text, but how many of you know that the Bible actually refers to a whole lot of books that are not in the Bible? These are just a few. I don't know about you, but every time I was reading the Bible, because I accept the Bible to be divinely inspired scripture, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by men. And yet these Holy Spirit inspired authors are quoting all these other books. I'm like, well, where, where, where are these other books? You know, and I've wanted to look into them. And, you know, we also see in scripture that at the mouth of two to three witnesses, we establish truth. And that's in multiple places as well. So whenever I'm looking to establish a belief system for myself or doctrine, if you will, I want to see confirming witnesses. Don't give me a doctrine that you believe in that's based on one verse. I, I want to see confirmation. Scripture confirms itself. Scripture interprets itself. I'm looking for two to three witnesses to establish truth. Now, there are other books that are not in our canonized scriptures right now that I find really interesting. I do not hold them on the same level as scripture. But these are books that are referred to in scripture. In Holy Spirit inspired scripture, the authors are either quoting these books directly, they're mentioning them by name, or they are referring to something that has no frame of reference anywhere else in the canonized text. And so I consider that, and that's why I've titled them, the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra biblical texts. The reason I say that is because they are synchronized in the sense that they tell the same story in the same chronological order of events that you find in Genesis. I call them biblically endorsed for the reasons I just mentioned. They are quoted by Holy Spirit authors of Scripture. And, of course, extra-biblical because we don't currently find them between the covers of our Bible today. But when you take these books, and that's what I did, is I, I published a version, a book that I have back there, uh, Genesis and the Synchronized Biblically Endorsed Extra-Biblical Text, that has Genesis in the King James and the Septuagint side-by-side -side as a parallel Bible because there are some interesting differences between the two. And then you have Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees also in there, in their full volumes. When you combine these four books together, you end up with an extremely detailed story about what I call the Genesis 6 experiment. What happened in Genesis 6? Specifically, in verse 4, we see the Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. Again, do you see the sons of Seth in there? Do you see the daughters of Cain in there? Okay, just to be clear. And Job, many scholars accept to have predated the Torah. The, the, the book of Job is uh, supposedly the oldest uh, canonized text of scripture that we have. And Job sets the precedence for the phrase, the sons of God. And when you go back and look at how the phrase sons of God is used in the book of Job, it's in reference to angels. I'm not going to go down that path right now, but just to say that the sons of Seth theory didn't exist until 160 AD. Prior to that, the unanimous view, including people like Josephus, was that we're talking about angels. 
Um, the canonized internal witness for the Enochian angelic view of the Genesis 6 experiment are in a numerous places. These are just a few. In Genesis 6, Moses mentions the word Nephilim with no further need of elaboration. In other words, he, he understood what it was and his audience did. He didn't have to explain it to them. They say, oh, yeah, we know. Uh, he uses the idiom uh, for angels, sons of God, the same one that Job used. In Leviticus 16, I believe it's 16. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I believe it's in Leviticus 16. It talks about the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. Is that correct? Leviticus 16? I think it is. If I'm not, look it up. But where where they have, the, you got the two goats, you know, and you cast the lots and everything. And, uh, King James says scape, scapegoat. But if you actually look it up in Hebrew, it's Azazel. It's a proper name. It's an individual. You're sending the goat out to Azazel. Well, if all you have is a canonized text and you want to dismiss all the other texts, you have no frame of reference for who or what this Azazel character is or why they're laying their hands on a goat and sending it out to them. You know, they're laying their sins on the goat, but it's symbolically by laying their hands on the goat and they're sending the goat out to the wilderness. Well, in the book of Enoch, it tells you that Azazel, all sin, sin was ascribed to Azazel, and that's why they're sending the goat out to Azazel. That's precedence in the book of Enoch. Numerous descriptions of giants throughout the Old Testament. Again, you have no frame of reference for that. If you have the Sethite view, there's no way you're going to explain that. Numbers 13 and Amos 2 being most notable, along with other scriptures obviously talking about Goliath and Agabashan and their relatives and stuff like that. Both Peter and Jude referred to the quote-unquote angels that sinned who were bound in chains and cast into the prison of Tartarus. In the canonized text, do you have any story that you can think of that talks about angels that sinned that were bound in chains and put in Tartarus? I can't find it anywhere. It, it's The Greeks borrowed from the Hebrews, actually, on that. The Greeks on, uh, and Josephus, he likens the first generation Nephilim uh, to the titans of Greek mythology. He makes, and so do some of the other church fathers, quote unquote, church fathers. But this clearly shows that both. Peter and Jude had read those texts, understood those texts, and under ho the Holy Spirit's inspiration, endorsed it with their statements that they made. And then Jude goes so far as to, in our vernacular, basically cut and paste the paragraph, put it in his book. Among other statements found in the ca canonized text, which find no precedence anywhere else but Enoch and other texts which affirm it. I put together timelines. Again, I, I've mentioned that before. I like to put things in visual format. And best I can figure out, looking at the information available. This is the timeline I came up with as far as when the Genesis 6 experiment took place, roughly 3550 BC in the days of Jared. First generation Nephilim would only live for 500 years. Within that time, they were to kill each other off in what became known by the Greeks as the Clash of the Titans. Ever hear the movie Clash of the Titans? That fictionalized story goes back to the real event of the first generation Nephilim that Josephus and others likened to be the Titans were to wipe each other out in a massive civil war. Uh, then around 3114, you have the Aztec calendar stone, the Mayan calendar, remember all that, 2012 and all that? That shows up around 3114. Shortly after, about 20 years or so, uh, is the death of Adam. Then you have about 20 years later, 25, the, the, the end of the first generation Nephilim. And then their parents, the Watchers, are judged, bound, and buried for 70 generations. Remember that, 70 generations. We'll come back to it. Then we have a time of peace after Enoch is raptured. Enoch is, is was or was not, right? For God took him. Uh, and we'll talk some more about that in a little bit. And then we had a time of peace for almost 100 years, and Noah is born, and his daddy named his son Rest. Well, that just makes sense, because it was after the chaos of the Clash of the Titans. He named his father, his his child rest. There is no further written documentation anywhere of other incursions of angels coming back and doing that again. The judgment was extremely severe and took care of that problem. Now, uh, this is one of those videos I'm going to play that may be a little bit sensitive for some children, uh, but it's from a TV series called Ancient Aliens. Have you guys ever heard of that show? I think it ran for like six seasons or something like that. Quite a number of seasons. They had an episode, I think it was in season six, that was called Alien Breeders. And I was actually asked to speak at a secular UFO conference in New Jersey a few years ago. And uh, I mean, I knew the, most of the people, the other speakers that were at that event were some of the people that are in the show, Ancient Aliens. Not the guy with the big hair, though. You know, like Giorgio. Uh, but a few of the others. 
So I'm like, okay, I know, I know who I'm going to be sharing the stage with, and I know the mindset of the audience. But they asked me to come there. The, the event coordinator, who was also a believer, had been following my stuff. He says, I think they're ready to hear another point of view. I think you're the guy to do it. I said, okay. I said, do you think they'd be offended if I use some of their own lingo against them? He goes, nah, go for it, dude. I said, all right. So I took footage from one of their episodes, Alien Breeders. And then at the end of it, I'll see if you catch it, but at the end of it, I changed their their opening dialogue just a little bit. Highly advanced humans living thousands of years ago. Unidentified DNA in the human genome. And ancient chronicles describing heavenly interventions on Earth. Demonic seduction. You cannot resist or do anything about it. Hybrid offspring. People believe that he was half dragon and half human. And strange abductions. These beings from outer space wanted to have sex. In cultures throughout the world, there are tales of intimate encounters with extraterrestrial beings. But could these stories be more than just myth? We should finally come to grips with the idea that extraterrestrials had something to do with our development. Clearly, there are entities out there which have an agenda, mating with human beings for their own purpose. Millions of people around the world believe we have been visited in the past by extraterrestrial beings. Did ancient aliens really help to shape our history? And if so, might we be the product of alien breeders? An anthropologist from the University of Wisconsin, Dr. John Hawkes, did a comprehensive analysis of human DNA going back for many thousands of years. And what he found was astonishing. If you look at the DNA from someone in 3000 BC, and you compare that to the DNA of someone alive today, it has changed by 7%. Mapping the human genome, Dr. Hawks found that in the past 5,000 years, our DNA has evolved at a rate 100 times greater than any previous 5,000 year period in our history. So what happened in the last 5,000 years that altered the structure of human DNA by 7%? Throughout world cultures and mythologies, this idea of otherworldly beings, gods, supernatural beings, demons, having sex with humans is very, very common. The way that we interpret that experience depends on the cultural and religious factors around us. We can read about these accounts of all sorts of weird beings who had their way with humans. Perhaps further evidence can be found, not by scientists, but by religious scholars. Millions of people around the world believe in the Hebrew Bible. What if it were true? catch it you catch the part that i changed normally it says millions of people around the world believe in ancient aliens what if it were true and i just changed it to millions of people around the world believe in the hebrew bible what if it were true and i pulled it i said look you guys quote from our book all the time would you mind if i did so too cool let's go you know got right into it but this is the paradigm that's being pushed right now Evolution has run its course. And this is the other reason why I'm pretty passionate. We can probably kill that other microphone. I think we got double. Something's really loud here or something. Um, The standard cosmological worldview makes it possible for this ancient aliens thesis to be true. Evolution has run its course. They know it. The more they've drilled down into the human genome, the more they've begun to understand the intricacies of DNA and things like that, the more they are forced to acknowledge there has to be a creator. 
And then you have you ever seen the documentary uh, Expelled? You ever see that? Where Professor Richard Dawkins, who's like the, the mouthpiece for evolution, is being interviewed and he acknowledges, yeah, there's an extreme design to it. But he says it could have come about in the following way. Perhaps some advanced civilization somewhere out there in the universe, you know, uh, of course, they would have also had to evolve through some sort of Darwinian evolution. They were at such an advanced state that they came to this planet and they seeded this place for the with, with the information necessary for evolution to then take place. All they've done is push the problem further out into space. But the standard cosmological worldview that is put into place has made that possible for them to do so. And that's the other reason I'm passionate about this is because I don't know what's coming, but I keep my, I keep my ear to the ground and I'm listening to what these guys are saying. I don't care what you believe regarding this stuff. They believe this stuff. And they're pushing this stuff. They have these, these conventions, this uh, disclosure. Have you ever heard of disclosure? That's where they have these big conferences where PhD, PhD level people get together and world leaders get together to discuss the uh, inevitable arrival of space people. Did you know they actually appointed an ambassador to United Nations for aliens? So that if aliens ever show up, we've got a representative of Earth to say hi. I'm not kidding. We laugh, but it's true. And around the same time, the Vatican said, yeah, when they show up, we'll baptize them, dot, 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 if they need it. Because the other thing that's being pushed is they may be on a higher spiritual level than we are. So maybe we've got something to learn from them. That is only possible in the standard cosmological worldview. And the worldview that I showed you yesterday, I believe the Bible absolutely supports, that is not even remotely plausible. Can't happen. But you'll notice David Wilcock was, was quoting something by uh, Dr. John Hawks, who did a study on DNA, and they determined that something happened to the human genome around 3000 BC. And they're seeing it in the genetic codes. Something happened. Well, I mean, when I saw that, I was freaking out because I'd already established that long before I even saw that episode, just using the, the canonized and the biblically endorsed text, that was the exact timeline that I came up with that something happened to the human genome at that time period. But it was dealt with in 3000 BC. The watchers who did that were judged, bound, and buried for 70 generations, and, and there, nobody else is going to do that again. So then we have the birth of Noah. So what happened? By the time the, the Genesis 6 experiment took place about 1,200 years before the flood. 500 years, the first generation Nephilim are done, and the parents are judged, bound, and buried. So we still got about 700 years to go. To the flood and i'm going well what happened in the 700 years that got god so upset that he had to wipe out the whole world and that's when i started drilling in deeper and deeper and deeper and discovered that there was actually a pre-flood return of the nephilim and when you use those ancient texts and again i don't need to consider them to be scripture how many of you know truth exists outside of scripture i read a manual told me how to work this computer not in scripture but it was true I've had math books, told me two plus two, right? That was true. Not in scripture. So truth does exist apart from scripture. So I just look at it as additional information. If I see something that contradicts the canonized text, I throw it out. You know, the canonized text is going to take precedence. But when I look at these texts and, you know, break down the Genesis 6 narrative, it synchronizes as you see there. I'm not going to read all of that just for the sake of time. But you see, you know, each verse in the, in the Genesis account is backed up with the witnesses of those other texts right there. And when you get to Genesis 12, I found it really interesting. Excuse me, Genesis 6, 12. Genesis 6, 12 says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. That's all we get. Well, how did that happen? How did all flesh get corrupted? Well, Joshua gives us a whole lot more detail and tells us it got corrupted because men began to blend species together, mixing animals and birds and reptiles and humans. And Jubilees backs that up in Jubilees 724. And after this, this right there being the first incursion of the Watchers, after that event, they sinned against the beasts and the birds and all that moved and walked on the earth. And much blood was shed on the earth. And every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. Remember last night I said, you know, we're not at the place where people have only evil continually. Well, when I was contemplating that, I was thinking, about, you know, there have been a lot of bad people that have done a lot of terrible things throughout history, right? But 
we have documentation and video even of some of the more recent tyrants and whatnot having tender moments with their kids and their wife and we know they may have done terrible things but they didn't have only evil all the time going on in their heart and mind now i'm taking this literal i'm going to go i'm going to be a biblical literalist here right they had only evil continually in their heart and mind and violence was the result of it and right around the time that i was contemplating all that and really studying it and looking into it the one of the spider-man movies came out and it was a spider-man movie that had the he was fighting the lizard and in that you have this character right here who was a good guy he was a, a, a scientist a doctor he had lost part of his arm in a combat situation and he was trying to figure out what is it about lizards you could cut their tail off right and it grows back what's the genetic code that causes limb regeneration so he starts experimenting on mice and rats and stuff, cutting their legs off and trying to inject lizard DNA until eventually he gets a code right and the leg grows back. Wow, cool. So he decides to try it on himself. He injects his stump and sure enough, his limb regenerates, his hand grows back, but he had an unfortunate side effect. He became a giant lizard creature that had only evil continually in his heart and mind. And the whole rest of the movie was about him causing a whole lot of violence for Spider-Man. Now, I'm saying to myself as I'm looking at that, I'm like, Hollywood gets it. They understand it. The church is thought, that's a Sephite theory. No, they're, they're completely clueless. And yet they're getting exactly right. God, how many of you, if you studied the Torah, how many of you know that God is against mixture? Even to, you know, uh, what is it? Um, wool and linen, right? Yeah, well, you got, you got plant and animal, you know? And he, he talks a lot about that, through, especially through the book of Leviticus. He's against the mixture. You know, he created everything to reproduce after its own kind. And he set the kinds up to be very specific. And Paul talks again later, there's, you know, there's a certain flesh for birds and for this and for that. Everything is supposed to be after its own kind. But in the pre immediate pre-flood world, 120 years, men began to cross those barriers and start to do genetic manipulation, creating hybrids. And the evidence is all over the ancient record. How many of you have seen the carved sculptures and pictures and stuff from ancient, you know, the, the Greeks with the centaur, the minotaur, satyrs, the Egyptians, you know, people, human bodies, animal heads. It's all over, all over the ancient world. You have animal-human hybrids. And I was in, um, I forgot who it was that was asking if we'd been to Athens. Who asked that question? Zach. Yeah, I'd been to Athens. I've been to Greece twice. <clears throat> and on my second trip, I was really struck by, it seemed like everywhere you looked, and I've been on Mars Hill and been all over the area, walked in down there. It, Paul wasn't kidding when he said they had a God basically for, every, for everything, including, you know, let's just make sure we got all the bases covered. Let's have an unknown God represented here too. It, it seemed like everywhere I looked, I saw the toppled remains of a temple or the remains of a statue of a God or some kind of depiction of an animal hybrid everywhere. And I came home from that trip and, and I told Sheila, I said, you know, honey, I can't escape this. It's like everywhere I look in the ancient world, you got animal human hybrids. I said, I think they were real. I don't think it was just, you know, mythology. And I was talking with a friend of mine who grew up in Greece and I kept using the word myth and mythology. And he stopped me at one point. He said, Rob, you know, you keep saying myth and mythology. He said, when I grew up in Greece, we were taught that as history. It was taught to me as history, not mythology. I talked to another guy that I worked for that uh, grew up in Norway. In, one, in the course of a conversation, we started talking about trolls and, you know, gnomes and different things that you see in the Norse mythology. And he got real serious. He's like, oh, dude, you don't kid around. That stuff's real. Like, when, you know, we're only taught that as fantasy mythology here. And so we had this conversation. I think the animal-human hybrids were real. She goes, hey, you know, we had a good conversation. And the next morning, she wakes up, goes to the other room, checks her email. And you know how you have, like, the news feeds, you know, whatever BBC news feed shows up in her email client there. And um, it said, scientists had successfully cloned a sheep with a human heart. And the article went on to say, if we continue to do this, eventually the genes will fuse together and we're going to end up with animal-human hybrid chimeras and we're going to have all kinds of ethical issues to deal with after that. And I was like, the next morning, you want to talk about confirmation, <laughs> two witnesses, right? And that's what set me on my journey to really start looking into all this stuff because I think it's very real. And we're seeing it today. Yes, Steve talked about, you know, when Yeshua comes and what it means in, as it was in the days of Noah. And what he said is true. But the other side of that is what was going on in the days of Noah that led to the corruption of all flesh, that led to men having only evil continually and 
violence everywhere. And we're doing that exact same thing in laboratories today. So <clears throat> after the flood, we end up with this character, Nimrod. I call him the post-flood man of many names. And in the two timeline charts that I developed regarding that time period, the 350 post-flood years of Noah's life, I start tracing, you know, who came from who and, you know, the overlaps. It is neat. Uh, I guess Zach has a graphic also showing the overlaps of who lived, you know, at the same time as somebody else. And it is really interesting when you see it visually who ha they had access to for information. And after I did this timeline chart right here, I wanted to unpack that a little bit more. And I made this one because I realized there are, are two characters that show up about the same time. Nimrod shows up first and then Abraham as Abram. And they are big time rivals. I mean, this is where really, you know, uh, L.A. Marzulli has a book called The Cosmic Chess Match. And the idea behind the book is basically, you know, God makes a move, the devil makes a move. This, this whole move and counter move kind of cosmic chess match taking place. And I, I thought that was a brilliant um, way of illustrating it, this whole idea of a cosmic chess match. These are the two main players on the board, as far as I'm concerned, Nimrod and Abraham. And of course, you have the Tower of Babel. Nimrod creates the Tower of Babel, and we see in Genesis 11 that the whole earth was of one language. They're all gathered together in the plains of Shinar, and they're building this thing. And it says in King James, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And it says that God comes down there, he checks out what they're doing. He gets upset about it, and he makes a statement. He says, nothing will be restrained from that which they have imagined to do. That's an extraordinary statement. He's not just saying, oh no, they know how to build buildings. That's scary. If you get into what they had actually imagined to do, and we will in a second here, you can understand why God did what he did. Now, part of what they intended to do was kill God, which I don't believe is possible. It's not possible to kill God, but the other things that they intended to do, his statement right there seems to imply that it was at least theoretically possible for them to do, this, do so. Now, if you've listened to any of my previous teachings prior to about two and a half years ago, regarding the Tower of Babel, I always said it was not about height. Right. I said, <clears throat> you know, if it was really about high, if you're trying to build a tall tower get it to, and, you know, start on a mountain or something, you don't build it in the plains. I mean, duh, that'd be stupid. Right. So therefore, it must be a stargate. Right. They must be they're trying to rend the veil. You know, they, they, they're creating a stargate so they can go from this realm and go through the stargate and get into heaven. And there are a lot of people out there still teaching that. I taught it and was pretty passionate about it. And then it's just like this you know, walking in Torah before we, be, 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 we should have like, you know, BT before Christ, but before Torah, BT, right? In my BT life, you know, there's so many things that we read right past, read right over, I even underlined and annotated stuff and didn't get it. And then, you know, uh, after Torah, I look at it and go, wow, how, how did I miss that? You know, well, I mean, it's the same thing with some of this other stuff that I'm looking at here. And I've even published the book. I got Jubilees back there and some of these other ones. And I look in these things for more detail about the Tower of Babel and see things like this. And they uh, built it 40 and three years, 43 years they were building it. And it also says there's about 600,000 men at the time. So there's a pretty decent population. Its breadth was 203 bricks and the height of a brick was a third of one. Its height amounted to 5,433 cubits and two palms. The extent of one wall was 13 stades, and of the other 30 in Jubilees 1021. Note, 5,433 cubits equals 8,150 feet. Another guy I, I stumbled across his research, Alfred Edersheim, wrote a book, Bible History, Old Testament, Chapter 8. He says, of the magnificence of Babel, the capital of the empire of Nimrod, the mighty hunter, it is difficult to convey an adequate conception without entering into details foreign to our purpose. But some idea of it may be formed from its extent, which according to the lowest computation covered no less than 100 square miles. We're talking the base of the tower. While the highest computation would make it over 200 square miles. Well, now all of a sudden I'm going, well, no wonder they built it in the plains of Shinar. They needed a big enough space to build a base for a building that big. That's one huge structure. Joshua even goes so far to tell you that it took a year to get to the top of the thing. 
and they were building brick, you know, making the bricks and stuff like that. And if, if a brick fell, man, everybody was upset. They would mourn the brick. But if a dude fell off, fell, you know, a guy fell down, nobody cared. Because it was a, a big labor that they were going through there. Uh, and it says in the Joshua account, they imagined in their hearts to war against him and to ascend into heaven. Goes into greater detail and says, all these people and all their families divided themselves into three parts. The first said, we will ascend heaven and fight against him. The second said, we will ascend to heaven and place our own gods there and serve them. And the third part said, we will ascend to heaven and smite him with bows and spears. And God knew their works and all their evil thoughts. And he saw the city and the tower which they were building. And then it goes on to say how he was upset about it and confounds their language. So their plan was, and they had three camps to get in there and take out the angels, take out the throne room, get rid of God and set up their own gods and presumably Nimrod to be king of the everything. So we pick up in Genesis, right? He confounds the languages. Now, if you look through lots of ancient Hebrew literature, you'll see that they believe that there were 70 different languages that came out of the Tower of Babel, 70 different nations. I believe Hebrew was the original language, the language of God, and I believe through Abraham, it, the, the language of Hebrew was retained. And then you got 69 other people groups speaking 69 other languages. And I, in the cosmic chess match scenario, I see sort of like this vision of God saying to Satan, okay, you want to take me on? Fine. I'll give you 69. I'll take one. Give it your best shot. And then you have all these people going off with different languages, 69 different languages, talking about the same guy who was their former leader. But now his character becomes known by a number of different names through different cultures. These are just a few. Gilgamesh, Baal, Melkart, Adonis, Demuzi, Dionysus, Bacchus, Mithra, Orion, Apollo, Tammuz, Osiris. Um, and when you study these characters, and there are others out there, and I got to give credit where, where credit is due, um, Peter Goodgame was the first person that I read uh, to put a lot of these parallels together and showing the synchronicities and stuff. And that's what got me started down the path. Once I went down that path, you know, you start seeing characteristics of these gods, and, they, and they, many of them are almost identical. And you start saying, well, they're too similar to not be the same, and, and even in the way they're depicted often. So these are just a few that, that I tend to focus on. And I believe this helps us to identify the beast. Now, this, thus saith the Lord, this is thus thinketh Rob, looking at the text. Because I, I believe the scriptures tell us everything we need to know. Amos 3, 7, God says, I'm not going to do anything except to tell the prophets first what I'm going to do. So you have Yeshua saying that the last days are going to be such that there's never been a time like it, and there never will be a time ever again like it. It's the most significant time in all of human history, the end times. So do you think he's going to leave us, leave us hanging concerning the identity of the characters that are going to play a part in the last days? I don't. I think he's going to tell us exactly who we're dealing with. So that's the premise that I launched in my research with, and it takes us to a section I call Identifying the Beast. And <clears throat> there are lots of scriptures that talk about the end times tyrant, the Assyrian, the beast, the lawless one, the Antichrist. I'm going to kind of work backwards. Look at Revelation 17, 8 through 11. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Stop. Where does the beast come from? So he's not coming from Hawaii or Kenya or the United Nations or New York or the Vatican. How many have you heard one or all of those is where the beast is, the Antichrist is coming? He's coming from the European Union. He's coming from the Vatican. He's coming from uh, Kenya. Everybody knows Obama's the Antichrist. I mean, you know. Uh, you know, we have a very, a very Amero-centric view of prophecy sometimes. It's like every president we've had is a candidate for the Antichrist. I mean, I don't, I don't vote. I don't believe in the system. If you see my Babylon Rising material, you know why. It's just the whole thing's rigged for one thing. But you know, I was kind of just sitting back, going, I wonder what's going to happen if Hillary gets in, because I want to see all the eschatology guys out there tap dancing to explain why she's going to be the Antichrist. Because you know somebody's going to do it. You know, our president's always got to be the Antichrist. It says he's coming from the bottomless pit. I'm not going to look anywhere else but there. That's what the scriptures say. This is an open book test. Where does the beast come from? The bottomless pit. Okay. 
uh, <clears throat> and he will go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. That's interesting. We see that a few times, don't we? The one who was and is not and yet shall be. How is Yeshua referred to in the beginning of the book? The one who was and is and is to come. So we have an antithesis here. The one who was and is not, but yet shall be. And here's the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads, we've got this weird beast. This is one of those situations where I believe if it's going to speak in allegorical, metaphorical, symbolic terms, you need to you know, look at it and see does a character show up to explain it. Otherwise, can I take it literally or should I take it as a metaphor? Well, here we've got a symbol. We've got this beast with seven heads. You have this angel showing up to explain it. He says the beast that he had seen, <clears throat> the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. We've just been given an enormous amount of detail to understand who this character is right here. Now, you'll notice it says kings. That's because the word that's used there is the word, uh, the, the word in English, kings, is basileus, Strong's number 935. It's defined as a king, ruler, emperor, etc. John did not use the closely related word basileus, Strong's number 932, which means a kingship, sovereignty, kingdom. A lot of people who teach on end times always want to make this kingdom. You know, this, these are seven kingdoms. It says kings. Use the word for kings, individuals, people. Five people have fallen. Yes, now people rule kingdoms. So when they fell, maybe their kingdoms fell. But the focus here is on five people because we're trying to identify the beast who is an eighth but is of the seven, right? Because he was, is not currently, but yet shall be. So um, thinking about people throughout biblical history who had antichrist-like characteristics, uh, Peter Goodgame put together a list that after I looked through it and saw his reasoning for it, uh, agreed with, and with slight variations, but he reasoned five have fallen. Thinking about people in the Bible that have antichrist-like characteristics, you have Nimrod, obviously. He creates a one world, you know, the new world order, there's nothing new about it. It's, a, it's just a rerun, especially when you consider everything about the new world order and the all-seeing eye and the back of your dollar bill and all of that stuff, all goes back to worship of Osiris. Secret societies are all about Osiris. And if Osiris is Nimrod, well, there you go. There's nothing new under the sun. He's obviously a great type for Antichrist. The Pharaoh of Egypt at the time of the Exodus thought himself to be a god, decided to wipe out God's people, a candidate. Sennacherib, same thing, a Syrian, thought himself a god, to decided to try to wipe out God's people. Uh, the angel, he goes home and the angel of, his Lord, of the Lord wipes out, I think it was 180,000 troops in one night or something like that. Interesting character. King of Tyre, you start reading about him, it starts off talking about a man, but then the description spins off into characteristics of Satan. So clearly he has some kind of affiliation with the devil. Antiochus Epiphanes, now he would be in, depending on your Bible, would be in what, if you have your 66 book, King James, you would say it's in the uh, intertestament period. If you have the original King James, which had 80 books, you can read the Maccabees and see that he is there as a character. Who, uh, if you know the account, you know, he went into the temple and set up a statue of Zeus on December 25th, incidentally, offered up a pig. And actually Maccabees, I think it's 1 Maccabees 4, if I'm not mistaken, tells you point blank that the act of bringing a pig into the temple and, and sacrificing it there was called the abomination of desolation. That's what it's called, bringing a pig into the temple. And as soon as we were reading this, uh, Sheila says to me, she goes, wow. So what does that mean if we bring pig into our temple? Just food for thought. <laughs> Um, Alexander the Great is another interesting character that I, I could consider as an alternative to number five. Um, you know, you look at his life and what he did, he's the he-goat in the book of Daniel, and it says that he has a little horn between his eyes, and the little horn is the first king. I'm going, well, what's the first king? It was not the first king of Greece or anything else at that time. If it's representing the first king, the first king that we have any record of, biblically speaking, is Nimrod. So it seemed that he had done whatever he did in the similar rebellious fashion as Nimrod, to me anyway. The one that now is, at the time of John, that depends on when you think is, is, as Bill Clinton would say. What's the definition of is? Uh, really, dude? Um, 
That depends on when you think John wrote the book of Revelation. Some people believe that he wrote it before the destruction of the temple. Some people believe that he wrote it after the destruction of the temple. You know, 90 AD is what I was raised to believe. Either way, you end up with a Caesar. It's either Nero or Domitian. Either one are good candidates. They always thought they were gods and certainly persecuted God's people. And then we read about one that will come, but his reign will be short. And I think a reasonable case could be made for Adolf Hitler. And I think a lot of people that lived during that time probably thought they were living in the tribulation. Speculation, of course. Um, let's look at Revelation 13 now. Somebody mentioned the deadly wound. Well, we got to keep this in, all in the same context. We're talking about the beast here. It says, and I saw one of the heads, the heads of the beast with seven heads, as it were wounded to, de to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Okay, so if we accept this list as uh, a reasonable list for what's spoken of in Revelation 17, let's see who had a mortal head wound. Well, Nimrod did. Uh, his, uh, According to Joshua, uh, Esau cut his head off. That's a head wound. Uh, Pharaoh... At the time of Egypt, uh, did not. Sennacherib did not. King of Tyre did not. Antiochus Epiphanes, no. Alexander the Great, no. Nero, sort of. It said that he stabbed himself in the throat, and by the Hebrew reckoning, you might consider that part of the head proper. So let's, for the sake of argument, say that he's a candidate. And he, according to history, supposedly Hitler shot himself in the head, although recent forensic evidence says otherwise, that the skull was actually that of a female, and that he escaped to either Antarctica or Argentina, but that's a whole other seminar. So, <laughs> um, when you look at other definitions for the Antichrist throughout Scripture, especially the Old Testament, one of the phrases or one of the terms you hear uh, most often is the Assyrian. The Assyrian in the last days. Which one of these guys is an Assyrian? That's all you got left by process of elimination. Then you look at uh, um, Revelation 13, 4, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That is very similar to a statement in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Again, Gilgamesh being one of the stories about this character. Who can compare with kingliness? Who can say like Gilgamesh, I am king? The concept there is, whoa, who's like this guy? And he was a giant. In fact, if you go back to the narrative in Genesis chapter 9, um, Oh, excuse, is it 9 or 10? 9 or 10, when it's, I think it's 10. When it's talking about, um, the, yeah, 10, the table of nations, and talking about Nimrod, it says that Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth. That's what you get in King James. If you look up the word mighty one, it's Gabor, plural being Gaborim. That word can be translated as giant. In fact, in the Septuagint, it is translated as giant. It says Nimrod began to become a giant. Now, both definitions are correct. Mighty one, or giant. Both are applicable to the word Gabor, Gaborim. But David had mighty men too, didn't he? And David, were, he was out there with his mighty men out killing giants. So what's the difference? Well, this is where I see value in using something like the Septuagint, because you have the Hebrew scholars with their Hebrew language and their Hebrew context. They know the context of their history and everything. They translate the exact same word, Gabor, or Gaborim, two different ways, depending on who we're talking about. When it was talking about Genesis 6, giants, it used a, a gigantus, from which we get the word gigantic or giant. In the case of Nimrod, the same word, gigantus, word we use for giant. David's mighty men, ton dinatos, which basically means strong, powerful warrior. So they knew the difference. The word began has a, a sexual connotation to it. It's used the same word that is translated as began in King James, began to become. Uh, is translated elsewhere as sexual defile, defilement and prostitution. So looking at the text, it appears that through some sort of sexual ritual, I would say, he defiled himself and it changed him in such a way that he began to become a giant. That's in the canonized text. When you look in the other text, you see these characters are also giants, like Gilgamesh. So let's go with that premise. Let's compare Nimrod with Yeshua. Well, <clears throat> we know that Yeshua is the son of God, right? And he was also manifest as flesh as man, right? Gilgamesh was said to be one-third man and two-thirds God, one-third being 33.33% and two-thirds being what? Six, six, yeah, okay, okay, just checking. All right. <clears throat> um, as Osiris, he was known as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's a familiar title. As Osiris, Mithra, Tammuz, etc., his symbol was a cross. In the Egyptian, it'd be the Ankh, which the hoop in the Ankh represents resurrection. 
Interesting. He's depicted throughout multiple, multiple cultures as a dying and resurrecting figure. Of course, as Apollo and some of these other ones, as the son of God, in that case, Zeus which is interesting because Zeus is referred to basically as Satan in the book of Revelation, where it talks about uh, Pergamum, and they had the altar of Satan there. Well, the altar of Satan was the altar of Zeus that was in Pergamum that was relocated during World War II to Berlin. Interesting. And Obama created a replica of the seat of Satan for his Denver, Colorado acceptance speech. And that's when everybody's like, he's the Antichrist, he's the Antichrist. I'm like, no. I, I, for some reason, you know, I just have a hard time accepting the fact that the Antichrist needs a teleprompter to address the sixth graders. <laughs> Not that impressed. Who is like that? Who can make war with that? Yeah. It's not, not working for me. <laughs> Rules from elsewhere. And of course, we have uh, Yahuwah in heaven and Osiris as the god of the dead ruling from the underworld in Hades. And then we have the Antichrist mentioned by name in Revelation chapter 9. Where does the beast come from? Open book test, right? We saw that, the bottomless pit. Beast comes from the bottomless pit. When is the bottomless pit opened? At the fifth trumpet, Revelation chapter 9. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, or messenger, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek hath his tongue Apollyon. Apollyon is just a derivative spelling of Apollo. Scripture just told you who the Antichrist is by name. Where he comes from, everything, Apollo. It's Apollo. Revelation 9.11, 9.11, interesting also. His number is 666. Well, we talked about his being one-third man. Uh, man is a carbon-based organism, so the number of it is the number of a man, right, 666? Well, man, just by default, has by the carbon molecule anyway, would be 666. Six protons, six electrons, six neutrons. Two-thirds God, 66.6%. Um, this individual is, is known throughout the world by the depiction of an obelisk. I'm not going to get too graphic about why that is. Read the Osiris myth, you'll understand that. Essentially, it's a big phallic symbol. We have the largest phallic symbol in the world, set up in Washington, D.C., as a big middle finger sticking up to God. It just so happens to be 6,666 inches tall by 666 inches wide. Probably just a coincidence, I'm sure. Speaking of coincidences, uh, we also have another interesting one here. The spinning globe, 666, and the strong delusion. Who sends the strong delusion? God does. Why? Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The coming of the lawless one, the beast, the Antichrist, will be, and it's interesting that he's called the lawless one too, isn't it? Sheila's always like, you know, if, if we're not supposed to be keeping the Torah, why does God make a big deal out of a lawless one? <laughs> you know? And all of our holidays, quote unquote, beast feasts, Go back to this guy, December 25th, dying and resurrecting sun god of antiquity. All that stuff goes back to this guy, the lawless one. The people who are doing the Christmas and Easter, Xmas and Ishtar day are the same people typically that are arguing against what we're talking about here this weekend. Well, that all goes back to the lawless one. The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the power of Satan. He will use every kind of power, including miraculous signs, lying wonders. Ooh, look at the Hubble pictures from the space telescope and every type of evil to deceive those who are dying, those who refuse to love the truth that would save them. For this reason, for the reason of people not wanting to believe the truth, it says God will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Then all who have not believed the truth but have taken pleasure in unrighteousness will be condemned. Hmm. So much of the globe model, and I'm going to show you this to you in a minute, points to the number 666. Over and over and over again. This is about the lawless one, whose number is 666. Lots of signs and lying wonders, I believe, come from NASA on a regular basis. But by way of review, just let's just go back and see what the scriptures have to say. And since I'm the village idiot, I'll let um, Dr. Michael Heiser start this off. Proverbs 8, when he established the heavens, I was there when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Circular. He made firm the skies above, so on and so forth. Here's an interesting one. He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. How do you inscribe an orbit? <laughs> Hold that thought. Let that one bounce around in your noodle for a while. We'll come back to it. 
When you consider the numerous scriptures that reference the heavenly luminaries in motion and combine it with the many scriptures that describe the earth as being set on a firm foundation of pillars, fixed and not moving, plus the fact that Isaiah's circle was inscribed, if we were to employ the principle of Occam's razor, clearly the position that requires the fewest assumptions is that of the circular still flat earth. Everything else is wishful thinking at best. And that, thi- and that wishful thinking requires constant mental gymnastics, as we will see over the course of this series, in order to justify the spinning heliocentric globular earth mentality. And once again, let's go to Bible.cc, shall we? And look at Isaiah 40.22. And I'm using this function right here. You, know, you can also use the parallel function right here for English. These are all the English Bible translations. Okay. Uh, New International, Circle of the Earth. New Living Translation, Circle of the Earth. English Standard, Circle of the Earth. New American Standard, Circle of the Earth. King James, Circle of the Earth. Holman Christian Standard, Circle of the Earth. International, He Who Sits on the Disc of the Earth. Net Bible, oh, that's interesting. They come up with Horizon, which is not what the word hoog means. Uh, New Heart English Bible, He Who Sits Above the Circle of the Earth. God's Word Translation, Enthroned Above the Earth. They just throw the word out all, all together, I guess. Uh, JPS Tanakh, 1917, Circle of the Earth. Those, that's Jewish. That's the Jewish guys right there. They, you know, might know their own language. You call me crazy. Call me crazy. I know that's insane for me to suggest such a thing. But these uh, Jewish scholars who took their own Hebrew scriptures and turned it into their English version, the JPS Tanakh Bible, oh, they said circle of the earth. They didn't say reeling, rock and rolling, orbiting, spinning, globe sphere earth. They said circle of the earth. New American Standard, vault of the earth. That's interesting. They threw the word vault in there. Jubilee's Bible, Jubilee Bible 2000, Circle of the Earth, King James 2000, Circle of the Earth, American King James, Circle of the Earth, American Standard Version, Circle of the Earth, Dewey Rhymes Bible, Upon the Globe of the Earth, oh, that's interesting, Dewey Rhymes, oh, that would be following on the heels of uh, the Copernican Revolution, so that doesn't really surprise me, especially since this is a, a Catholic Bible. Copernicus' theory of a heliocentric universe was well known at the upper strata of the Catholic Church in his lifetime. While he preferred his theories published after his death, he ultimately agreed to publish his manuscripts on the persistent appeals of high church officials. The necessity to change public conception from an accurate belief in a flat, enclosed earth to a false belief grew slowly. With sapient baby steps, the whole world would become amenable to the final delusion of an alien invasion under the first woe. The Catholic hierarchy had the perfect opportunity to lay groundwork for a global deception to culminate in this Earth's final generation. This deception required a globe Earth spinning throughout the vast reaches of space, space inhabited by aliens and other sentient life forms. These contrivances created doubt in the Bible, putting science ahead of scripture, which advises mankind the Earth is enclosed and unmoving. They also place the Creator far away from His creation by presenting a universe unimaginably vast. To engineer this transformation in belief, the newly created Society of Jesus, commonly known as the Jesuits, became the agents of change. Following Copernicus' publications, it is probable the Jesuit order has produced more astronomers than any other demographic in Europe. That, ostensibly, a religious order should produce so many scientists should cause surprise. However, as these scientists have focused nearly exclusively in but one area, this gives us reason to question. Upon rejection of the sacred scriptures, which teach us Earth is a fixed, immovable object under a protective covering, a nefarious foundation was laid. Atop this were built perversions designed to force humanity to doubt the very word of our father, Yahuwah. With the biblical geocentric model rejected, a new explanation was required. A globe Earth, its orbit of the sun for millions of miles every year, 
illimitable realms of space with billions of galaxies, each composed of billions of stars with worlds innumerable. All this became necessary to explain the new heliocentric model of the universe, and mankind, over a short time, lost his divine significance. Thereafter was created an environment within which the writings of Charles Darwin found a receptive audience. Once science showed the Bible wrong, the disparager then diverged from her religious guise altogether. Anything suddenly became possible. There was nothing above question, including how the Earth seemed to appear in the vastness of space with all else and the existence of extraterrestrials. The Big Bang Theory is, today, the leading explanation about how the universe began. At its simplest, it talks about the universe as we know it, starting with a small singularity, then inflating over the next 13.8 billion years to the cosmos that we know today. Priest Andrew Pinsent holds advanced degrees in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, as well as a doctorate in particle physics from Oxford. In January 2015, he wrote, being both a priest and a former particle physicist at CERN, I am often asked to give talks on faith and science. Quite often, young people ask me the following question. How can you be a priest and believe in the Big Bang? To which I am delighted to respond. We invented it. Or more precisely, priest Georges Lemaitre invented the theory that is today called the Big Bang, and everyone should know about him. The author of the Big Bang Theory was none other than the Jesuit-trained priest Georges Lemaitre. Follow from cause to effect. 1. Without a globe Earth circling the Sun through the far reaches of space, we do not have the Big Bang. 2. Without the Big Bang, we do not have evolution. 3. Without evolution, we are more likely to accept creation as an act of intelligent design by a divine creator. The Roman Catholic Church does, in fact, accept evolution. So that's interesting. Darby translation, Circle of the Earth. English revised version, Circle of the Earth. Webster, Webster, hmm, Circle of the Earth. Captain Definition Man himself, Circle. Hmm. World English Bible, Circle of the Earth. Young's Literal translation, Literal translation, Circle of the Earth. Okay, now... Let's get really crazy. Let's go ahead and click on multi <laughs> and go past the English. Check for yourself. Check multiple languages, okay? They're all saying the same thing, and they're not saying anything about reeling and orbiting and rotating. Going in a circle, as in motion. They're describing a noun, a shape, circle, not sphere. None of these guys, except for Dewey Rhymes, came up with anything even remotely indicating a sphere here. Not one of them gave us any indication that Isaiah meant to say that the earth is spherical or revolving, reeling, orbiting, or in any other form of movement. Rather, they all indicated the simple, straightforward, circular nature of our world in the mind of the Holy Spirit-inspired authors of Scripture. Period. And, and while Dr. Michael Heiser may not agree with this personally himself, he doesn't believe the Earth is a circle, he believes the Earth is a sphere, he at least has the intellectual honesty, the integrity to show what the biblical authors meant. And they didn't mean globe. That's part of a video <clears throat> series I did called Theologians Gone Wild. <laughs> in response to several guys out there that were saying, well, circle means it's talking about the orbit of the Earth. And, and, you know, anyway, that's that's all part of that. Uh, I'm not saying it is the strong delusion. I'm asking if it is. It's a pretty good candidate when you go through it. I just did a search the other day on my phone. I was just sitting there. What is the speed of this alleged orbit? Because I keep hearing this all the time. Well, no, circle. He's talking about that's the circle of the orbit of the Earth. That's what he, that's what he, um, that's what that whole video was in response to. And I'm like, OK, what is the speed of the Earth going around the sun, supposedly? And. It's cleverly disguised as 18.5 miles per second <laughs> when you search for it. 18.5 miles per second. So I'm like, 18.5 times 60 seconds times 60 minutes. 
66,600 miles per hour. Interesting. Supposedly this globe that we're on is 25,000 miles in circumference, which amounts to eight inches per mile squared is the math. Eight inches, of course, being 0.666 of a foot. 10 miles being 66.666 feet. 100 being, you know, are you getting to see a pattern here? The tilt of the earth, I looked that up. Okay, the tilt of the earth, 23.5 degrees, 23.4, depending on who you read. The, the sources that I looked at were government sources. They were saying 23.4. 23.4 off of center, if you have a 90 degree angle, 90 subtract 23.4, 66.6. It's probably all just a coincidence, maybe. Maybe it is. This other guy who believes in the globe, I know I'm crazy. I'm crazy. I told you, you know, don't believe me. Remember the slide with the tinfoil hat? Or let's just say things that make you go, hmm. This other guy who believes in the globe it created this graphic, and I saw it on his website, godtype.com, and he was saying all these, the, all of these distances and nautical miles from various points of Antar to, uh, on Antarctica to the uh, Jerusalem, to the Vatican, Obelisk, to Washington, are 6,660 <laughs> nautical miles. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Godtype.com. It's up in the top corner there. Uh, you know, he believes in the globe and I, the tap dance he does around this to say that, you know, that's whatever. I'm like, okay, dude, yeah, sure. The number of the beast is 666. So, you know, most of us, the understanding we have of our globe comes from this organization right here or organizations affiliated with them or organizations that promote their work. Like the picture you've seen in every one of your textbooks from Apollo 17. Should we trust this organization? I didn't put all the slides in here that I wanted to. I had to cut it down for time. But I mean, just look into Jack Parsons, JPL. He's the founder of Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That dude was a hardcore Satanist, occultist. He was the disciple of Aleister Crowley. You guys know who he is? Who fashioned himself as the beast. He, he referred to himself as the beast. And Parsons was his disciple next to, who's the heir apparent. And he gets out there in the area that became known as Area 51. He's working together with L. Ron Hubbard, another freak that creates a cult called Scientology. They're out there doing ceremonial sex magic rituals out there to try to bring about the spirit of Babylon. That's, that, that's what leads into NASA. And then when you get to the formation of NASA, you got more than 100 or 1,600 Nazis escaped the judgment that they deserved and found refuge in America. A group of 104 German rocket scientists, including Werner von Braun, Ludwig Roth, Arthur Rudolph are pictured here at Fort Bliss, Texas in 1946. Many had worked to develop the V-2 rocket at Pinamunde, Germany, and came to the United States after World War II, subsequently working on various rockets, including the Explorer 1 space rocket and, of course, the Saturn V rocket at NASA. These are the people who founded NASA, and then they put Freemasons in charge of the whole thing. You look at the heads of NASA that were like set 32nd, 33 degree Masons, and then why is it that all of our astronauts have to be Freemasons or associated with Freemasons or have parents that were Freemasons or be in the military? That's the foundation of the organization that so many are putting so much trust in. What does the scripture say about the commandments, right? First one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So what do they do? All of their missions are named after gods. Mercury, right? You got Gemini, follow that. You know, the, the Gemini missions. And then, of course, we have Apollo. It's interesting that only um, six missions allegedly made it to the moon with two men walking on the moon. Six times two is 12. So we have the, the 12 apostles of Apollo are the ones spreading the, the, the message that here's the picture of Earth from the moon. When you look into Apollo, specifically those that claim to land on the moon, I could spend an entire weekend going through that stuff. But there are a lot of resources that you can look into, one of them being aulis.com, A-U-L-I-S. These are PhD level people going through the footage, going through, looking at the pictures, looking at stuff, and just shredding the Apollo missions. I was invited to speak in Amsterdam uh, several months back, almost a year ago now, I think, I uh, can't remember when, what, when it was exactly, but um, a, a high profile musician, let's just say, um, started looking at some of my materials on Flat Earth. 
As a result, he started looking into the Torah. As a result, he started attending my virtual house church. Now, this is a guy that's really up there in the hip hop, hip hop genre, you know, which is like so opposite, like who I am. You know, I'm, I'm a white guy, can't, you know, dance or, you know, do, do, <laughs> do anything. Uh, so this, this other rapper, uh, B.O.B., I think was his name, started becoming vocal about Flat Earth. And so, you know, this guy that I'm not going to mention his name, but he... Uh, he saw what that guy was looking into. He's like, what, what is this? You know, so he looked in that and then he stumbled on my stuff, stumbled on uh, Torah, started studi studying the Torah, started attending my virtual house church, then realized he needed to get saved, got saved. And then he said, well, if I'm going to get baptized, I'm going to do it right. So he got on a plane and flew to Israel and got baptized in the Jordan River. And he told me, you know, I'm sitting in this very expensive car, you know, with Sheila going, how does this happen? You know, he, he, he's going, he goes, I kid you not. I said, I came up out of that out of being baptized and he said the only word i got was bring rob skiba to amsterdam i'm like okay so and that was just so god has got such a crazy sense of humor uh, I'm, I'm giving this presentation in a venue called the milky way all right now the milky way venue had multiple different stages where concerts were taking place, like five different concerts taking place. And if you could have seen the marquee, right? Like the marquee is like all these yo-yo hip hop, you know, dudes, and there's like my goofy picture. <laughs> from <laughs> so, I'm in this place, you know, I'm talking like this stuff. And it was pretty soundproof, so I, you know, we couldn't hear what was outside and stuff. But every time they open the doors, like all this pot smoke comes in and like and all this <laughs> music and, I'm like, what in the hell does this happen? Um, but I'm like, okay, God, whatever. You know, I, that's, he called me specifically to talk about the stuff that I've been talking about this weekend. So that's what I did. And the crazy thing was he got booked on a, like a Tonight Show kind of thing that night that he's under contract with record labels and stuff. And he had to do that. So he couldn't even attend the conference that he paid for Sheila and I to go to. But a whole lot of other people did. And it was really interesting because I had known about this, that the moon rocks were first exposed as frauds by them in the Netherlands. Now, the Apollo astronauts went around and the big publicity tour at the time back in the 60s, giving various people in positions of royalty and whatnot, leadership, moon rocks. Well, they decided at one point they wanted to take an insurance policy out on it. So, of course, as part of doing the insurance policy thing, they start analyzing it and they found out the things petrified wood. Now, I'm at this venue, the Milky Way, and I find out that this museum is literally like a couple of blocks down the road. So I'm, I'm going to go there. So Sheila and I went there, and we get to the, the information desk, and they weren't even aware that they had the thing. I'm like, this is, this is supposed to be one of the signif most significant achievements of all of humanity. You would think you'd have that center display with, you know, like a halo oh, right over it, and the angels <laughs> floating over it, pointing at it. Like, look at what we did, you know? No. It, they had it tucked away in a warehouse somewhere, like in Indiana Jones, you know? They said that. It's tucked away in a warehouse. You have to get special appointment and blah, blah, blah. You know, she had to actually look it up. They had it. But I, I just thought it was rather poetic that here I'm, you know, the whole series of events that led me there, what I was talking about, and that was right down the street. They exposed it as a fraud. And just so happened, if you go look it up, that Werner von Braun and company were down in Antarctica in the late 1960s, prior to us allegedly going there in 69, looking for moon rocks. You can look that up for yourself. Going to Antarctica, looking for moon rocks. Well, first of all, at that point, we hadn't even been there yet. So how do you know, if you find a rock, that it's from the moon? It's not like you go, oh, made on the moon. Cool. All right, let's, uh, let's categorize that one. Oh, uh, this one's made on Mars. Put that one over here. There's no way you're going to know that. And we're allegedly in the space race <laughs> against the Russians, right? <laughs> we got to beat the Russians. They're going, they're going Sputnik, <laughs> right? So if we're in this big space race against the Russians and we got to get to space and get up there and, you know, Gregory or whatever is floating around up there, oh, we got to walk in space. Why are you down on a vacation in Antarctica? Very suspicious. I show this picture a lot of times to people and say, hey, this is associated with the Apollo moon landings. You know, can you tell me what region of the moon that is? People give various guesses. Some of you have probably seen it, so you know, you know where I'm going with this. Well, it's not the moon. That's Arizona. <laughs> it's where they, uh, Cinder Lake, Arizona, where they blew up Arizona to look like the moon. In fact, you can still see remnants of it on Google Earth today. 
I recently went there uh, because I had already done all the presentations and I was in Arizona not too long ago. I'm like, I'm going there. And if you saw the video I posted on uh, YouTube, it's called Rob Skiba Walks on the Moon. <clears throat> Did I, I shot a little selfie of myself, you know, there. Maybe that's why, you know, you had the before and after. You know, before, these guys were like, ooh, yeah, ooh. And then when you have the press conference, when they come back, allegedly coming back from the most significant thing human beings have ever done, ever, that's the way they looked. And if you watch the actual presentation, they don't, look, man, if, if I was on the moon, if I had ever walked on the moon, I'd, be, I'd still be floating when I came back here. You'd have to, like, tie a tether to me. So I didn't fly away, because I'd be spazzed. I'm pretty hyper anyway. I'd be spazzed, jacked out of my mind for the rest of my life. These guys look like their dog was shot. They just found out Santa Claus isn't real. The Easter Bunny, you know. <laughs> they, they were so, like, they, to me, honestly, they looked like good patriotic men that hated the fact that they had to lie. That's, I'm maybe reading too much into it. Fair enough. But watch it for yourself and see what you think. But So if that stuff didn't happen, then neither, neither did this. This is Apollo 17 that allegedly took this picture. And that's the only picture we've had until we get into much later. That was in 1972. Um, we have all these pictures put out by NASA. Uh, you know, which one is it? You know, they're always different. And if you look at these, a lot of these will tell you right, up, right off the bat, especially the 2002 one, the most famous one. This is a composite. It's created in Photoshop. This, the one in 2002 right there is... I went through that with a fine-tooth comb, if so to speak, in Photoshop and showed you where they're using the Photoshop clone tool to replicate clouds all over the place. It's manufactured. That same, they, they redid the old Star Trek episodes, the 1960 ones. They had all you know, cheesy special effects because they had basically the catering budget of today's TV shows to do what they did. Um, so they redid the special effects. So all the planet shots where they're going around the Earth or other planets or whatever were all redone. They redid the special effects. Well, there are several episodes of the old 1960s Star Trek where they went back in time or whatnot or found another planet that looked exactly like Earth, and they used that same Earth. And the way you could tell it is there's a cloud formation right there. It's like a backward C. It's like a backward C just off the East Coast. And uh, that is a separate layer in the 3D model. So that lot, it's not always over the East Coast of the United States. You'll see it in other places. But look for that backward C because it shows up all over the place. Um, so it makes me wonder, was NASA created to hide God? Now, I've seen this meme being passed around on Facebook and other places, that the Hebrew word NASA means to deceive. Yes and no. Um, uh, like the letter shin in the middle, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, it has a little dot over the right side of the shin. That depend, Depending on where that dot is depends on how you pronounce the word. You got the nun, shin, and aleph right there. When it's over the right side, it's pronounced more like nasha. It's pronounced the sh sound. When the dot is over the left, it's with a s sound. The first time it appears in our scriptures is in Genesis 3, when the serpent beguiled me. Nasha. Same word, just pronounced slightly different. The second time it shows up is when Cain receives his judgment and it says it's more than I can bear in Genesis 4.13. And that's when the dot is over the left side. And so that's when it's pronounced uh, NASA or NASA. So how interesting, the, the context in which both first appear, Nasha in reference to Eve being deceived by the serpent, and NASA in reference to Cain's punishment after killing his brother Abel, the word in that case, it's translated there as bear, but it also means to lift up. So I'm going, hmm, lifting up to deceive? Ah, uh, maybe. Oh, don't be silly, you can trust us. If that's true, what's the motivation? That's what I always hear. What's, what, what, why would they lie? What's the motivation, Rob? Well, this is just my thoughts on it. First, get people to doubt Yahuwah's word by destroying the very foundation of our Bible, Genesis, specifically the creation account. Second, set up a new paradigm where God is out and science is in. Evolution removes Yahuwah from the equation. When evolution finally runs its course and becomes utterly bankrupt, introduce the idea of intelligent design, but deny the true designer his due credit and place it rather on ancient aliens. Four, promote the ancient alien theme as much as possible in all forms of media by perpetuating the concept of Earth as a tiny blue marble, insignificant blue marble, by the way, orbiting an average sun in an average galaxy among trillions of other galaxies in an ever-expanding universe. With so much potential for life to exist in such a vast expanse, the idea of ancient aliens or ancient scientists, alien scientists, 
being our creators seems a lot more plausible over time and heavy indoctrination. The stage is set for our alien creators to return and bestow upon us their miraculous signs and wonders in order to convince us all the more that all religions are false. We then put our trust in them. Finally, when Christ does return, we are all convinced that he is the enemy and our united world gathers together to make war with him. That's just my thoughts on it. About what, if there is a, a grand conspiracy, what would the motivation be? Those are my thoughts on that. So let's tie it all together now. Tying it all together, a, a most peculiar timeline. So we have God creates the world in six literal days, describing essentially a snow globe enclosed world cosmology. Shortly after Adam and Eve are placed in the Garden of Eden, a serpent deceives them into disobeying Yahuwah, and a seed war begins. Cain kills his brother Abel. Seth replaces Abel, and the messianic seed is to come from his line. Plan B, corrupt the seed line. The Genesis 6 experiment occurs. Over a 1,200-year time period, all flesh becomes corrupted through various forms of Nephilim hybridization. Yahuwah destroys the whole world with a flood, preserving only those who made it onto Noah's Ark. The whole earth is populated by Noah's three sons. In 1908 AM, or a year since creation, Nimrod is born. Abram is born in 1948 AM, and the seed war continues with two human players on the cosmic chessboard, Nimrod versus Abraham. Nimrod builds a tower in order to reach into heaven and ultimately attempts to kill Yahuwah. His plan fails when Yahuwah confounds the languages. People disperse all talking about the same guy, Nimrod, and now only with uh, different languages, different names. Hence, he becomes the rebellious god of this world. Abraham produces Isaac, who produces Jacob, who is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. The stage is now set for the entire biblical narrative. All of that's within the first 12 chapters of Genesis, which ultimately leads to Messiah and his final victory in the cosmic seed war. Now let's drill down to more along our timeline. Nimrod, again, was born in 1908 AM, year since creation. Just so happens to be, if you flash forward to 1908 AD, Ernest Shackleton boarded a ship called the Nimrod. And he heads down to Antarctica on the Nimrod expedition. Now, in the biblical account, Nimrod went up to try to get into the firmament. In 1908, if this model is true, it looks like they went out to get to the firmament towards the outer regions. Now, People are like, well, if it's a flat earth, how come we don't fall off the edge? Well, because it just so happens to be, if you Google coastline of Antarctica, you see two to 300 foot ice walls. That would be the outside of the circle, so to speak. If you look into the Enochian account of what happened to, you know, what happened to him when he, Enoch was not, for God took him, where did he take him? Joshua says he was taken in a place of snow and ice. Uh, so I'm going, okay, that's interesting. So Nimrod heads down to, uh, Shackleton heads down on the Nimrod expedition. Many more Antarctic expeditions soon follow. In 1931, a guy named August Picard, who was a scientist, shoots himself up into the stratosphere. He got to nearly 52,000 feet, first guy to get that high, in a metal ball ha hanging from a balloon, and comes back describing, for popular science magazine, no less, the Earth as a flat disk with upturned edges. That was his description of what he saw. During World War II, the Nazis become obsessed with the occult and Antarctica. Just look into the Nazis and what they were doing down there. After World War II, the rest of the world suddenly becomes obsessed with Antarctica as well. Enter Admiral Byrd. He's an interesting character who allegedly flew to the North Pole region in the late 1940s, and he came back claiming to have found the entrance to Inner Earth, or Gartha. Now, this is a highly decorated, the youngest admiral in the U.S. military. Comes back talking about this in his diaries. The Babylon Working, I told you about earlier, takes place in 1946, along with L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology. JPL founder Jack Parsons, who was a disciple of Aleister Crowley, engages in ritualistic sex magic in order to incarnate a moon child with the scarlet woman named Babylon. Bird then goes to Antarctica, leading Operation High Jump in 1947. Why is it called Operation High Jump? Well, you got to jump up. <laughs> you got to get over that big ice wall there. What else happened in 1947? Lots of interesting things happened in 1947. Among them, the founding of the International Monetary Fund, the start of Jewish immigration to the land of Israel. A young Bedouin shepherd discovers the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's when he chucks a rock in there, hears a crack, goes in there, finds the scrolls. And then we have the alleged UFO crash near Roswell, New Mexico, all happening at that same time period. A nation calling itself Israel is established in 1948. 
MK Ultra begins early in the 1950s, officially runs from 1953 to 1973, coincidentally the same time as the space program. If you know anything about MK Ultra, that's all about government-sponsored mind control. In fact, if you go back to the uh, press conference, you see those three guys from Apollo 11 looking very depressed, and then he, uh, uh, Neil Armstrong says, and now we'll, he says something to the effect of, now we'll view the slides from our mission so that we can reacquaint ourselves with what happened. What? If I just went to the moon, I would have remembered every detail of every second of everything I did forever. I don't need slides to tell me what I did. You know, and when the slideshow comes on, all of a sudden these guys who are so like just bummed out, it looked like, become very animated and start like, Ooh. it was almost as if it, they were triggered in MK Ultra. The, the flight, as you know, started promptly. And I think that was characteristic of, of all the events of the flight. The Saturn gave us one magnificent ride. Both into Earth orbit and on a trajectory to the moon. Our, our memory of that actually differs little from the reports that you have all heard from, the, from those previous Saturn V flights, and, and those, the, the previous flights served us well in preparation for this flight in, in the boost as well as the, the subsequent phases. I'll, we, we would like to, to skip directly to uh, the translunar coast phase and uh, remind uh, ourselves of, of the chain of events that, long chain of events that actually permitted the landing, starting with the undockings, or the tr transposition and docking sequence. In the final phases of uh, descent, after a number of program alarms, we looked at the landing area and found a very large crater just in the very left top corner of the picture. The, the camera is located in the right window and looks to the right and did just barely sees this boulder field we're passing over right now. We're at 400 feet and those boulders are about 10 feet across. This was the area which we decided we would not go into, extended the range downrange, and saw this crater which we passed over, this 80 foot crater, in the final phases of descent and later took some pictures of. Is it a coincidence that MK Ultra was going through its height of its program at the same time as the Apollo program? I don't think so. Operation Deep Freeze takes place in Antarctica 1955 through 56. Sputnik is launched in late 1957. Both NASA and DARPA are formed in 1958. DARPA is the Defense Agency's research projects. That's where they do all the black budget projects to create super soldiers and all kinds of other things. DARPA and NASA created the same year. This is like after Operation Deep Freeze, all these people go down to Antarctica and then something happens. Everybody pulls out of there and they decide they have to set up the Antarctic Treaty. And the treaty was finally signed into effect in 61. The treaty says you can only go there under the express guidelines of this treaty. So yeah, you can go there. There's some flatters that are saying you can't go there. That's not true. You can go there, but only under the express guidelines of the treaty which means you can't just go, you know, take a boat, go there, and just go exploring Antarctica. You're going to go only where you're allowed to go. And so all of this is it's setting up a very interesting timeline, at least, you know, if you're wearing a tinfoil hat like I am, it's all kind of uh, going, oh, wait, wait a minute, this is really kind of wild here. And it gets worse when you get to Operation Dominic and Project Fishbowl, where they launched 31 nukes in 1962. Many of them were high-altitude nukes. Operation Fishbowl. Kennedy's speech, 1962, kicks off a space race leading to Apollo. Star Trek debuts in 1966 and goes right through 69. Apollo 11 allegedly lands on the moon in 1969. In 1972, coincidentally, just before MK Ultra officially terminated. And the Omega Plan kicks in shortly thereafter. I'm not going to go into the Omega Plan. I've got a 20-minute video on YouTube if you want to check that out. 
that describes what I consider to be the end times plan in great detail. Now, the next video you're going to see is a video that I put together after I discovered what was really going on with Operation Fishbowl. Now, with the tinfoil hat on playing conspiracy theory here, the flat earthers are claiming, and and I think it's a reasonable claim, that you know if that model is true, then we know we have a circle, the circle of the earth as described in the Bible, surrounded by Antarctica, the outer rim, that has a two or 300 foot uh, ice wall, cliff, that keeps everything in, hence Operation High Jump. You got to get over that, right? Uh, so it looks like, at least from the flat earther perspective, that probably during Operation Deep Freeze, they may have found the edge of the dome, presumably anywhere from 800 to 1200 miles inland from the coast. Uh, then everybody pulls out, signs this treaty, says nobody can go back except under the express guidelines of the international community that signed the treaty. So then all of a sudden the United States and Russia engaged in these high altitude nuclear tests. And the United States calls theirs Operation Dominic, within which we have Operation Fishbowl. Now, hold that thought. This is all happening. If you go and look uh, on the Operation Dominic uh, entry, you see the different dates. We're, we're 1962. This is the early part of 1962. We're talking May. I mean, look at all these bombs going off. 25 April, 1962. 27 April, 2 May, 4 May, 6 May, 8 May, 9 May, 11 May, 11 May, 12 May, 14 May, 19, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all before President Kennedy's let's go out in the space speech. But I, I think a lot of people don't realize that our first stop wasn't the moon. Even before we went to the moon, they were sending probes all of a sudden after all of this. Okay, keep the, keep the timeline in mind. Operation High Jump, Operation Deep Freeze, Bird Dives, NASA's founded, Antarctic Treaty signed, Operation Dominic and Fishbowl take effect. And if you notice during President Kennedy's speech, he was talking about that they've already got probes headed to Venus. Wait a minute. We're already sending stuff to Venus and Mars. We haven't even been to the moon yet. And so I was looking into that. And on planetary.org forward slash explore forward slash space topics forward slash space missions forward slash missions missions to Venus dash Mercury dot HTML. And uh, you can go through this site. Uh, it starts sort of from the bottom up. As early as February 4th, 1961, they're sending a probe, Sputnik 7, the, uh, Russia sent this probe to check out Venus. The final stage of the rocket carrying Sputnik 7 into orbit failed and the spacecraft was unable to achieve the necessary trajectory to carry it onto Venus. Then Venera 1, Russia, sends out another probe uh, February 12th, 1961. They lost uh, communications uh, while it was on its way to Venus. Then NASA sends up Mariner 1, July 22nd, 1962. Now, that's right in the middle of Dominic and Fishbowl that they, we sent out a probe to go check out Venus. Um, it veered off course and was destroyed by ground controllers. So then Russia sends up another one, Sputnik 19, August 25th, 1962. The spacecraft made it into orbit, but the rocket's last stage failed as Sputnik 19 was unable to achieve its Venus trajectory uh, and re-entered the Earth's atmosphere three days later. NASA, August 27th, 1962, uh, sends its probe. It says Mariner 2 was the first spacecraft to successfully fly by Venus at an altitude of 34,773 kilometers. The spacecraft discovered ground temperatures, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so... This is during the time period that between August 27th, 1962 and December 14th, 1962, that we had President Kennedy's speech in September, on September 12th, 1962. So that's what he's referring to. You know, we've already got stuff out there <laughs> and you can read about the other ones that were, you know, checking out Venus, I guess Mercury also, and uh, attempted probes going to Mars. Now, this is all before we've even been to the moon. So 
it, it appears that whatever happened in Antarctica, everybody got kind of maybe nervous or excited or whatever and said, okay, what is the deal? You know, we've looked through telescopes. We've seen our so-called neighbors, uh, Venus and Mars, through telescopes. Our assumption is the solar system is, you know, set up in the Copernican model. And um, but yet maybe, maybe they found a dome and they started to question all that. So the first thing they do is send out probes to go, wait a minute. What in the world? If this is if we're in a dome, how high does this thing go? So they start launching high altitude nuclear bombs. And if you look at the videos on Operation Fishbowl and Starfish Prime and all the, all those high altitude tests, I mean, it looks like they're hitting something up there. Um, I mean, at least from a conspiratorial tinfoil hat wearing perspective, that's what it looks like. Now, this is what blew my mind. You can read more on, on all that if you'd like um, to get caught up to speed on what's going on there. So I go to Lubbock and I'm doing this conference out there at uh, uh, Jared Cressman's uh, father's church, Dan, Pastor Dan Cressman. And uh, we get to talking about this whole issue of the flat earth stuff. And he goes, do you know what the name Dominic means? And I said, no. He says, you know, you talk about Operation Fishbowl, but check this out. I'm going to take you to, um, I'll put the screen share back up here. Take you to a uh, one of those name websites. I like using behindthename.com. Look up the name Dominic. And again, let's just double check it here. Dominic, D-O-M-I-N-I-C. Look up Dominic, D-O-M-I-N-I-C. From the late Latin name Dominicus, meaning of the Lord. Fishbowl was part of Operation Dominic. It looks like they are sending high-altitude nuclear bombs to test the fishbowl of the Lord, i.e. the firmament. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely one of those things to make you go, hmm. He says we already have probes on the way to Venus and Mars. Venus and Mars, 62. We didn't even allegedly go to the moon until 69. The moon is allegedly a quarter million miles away. Venus and Mars, they're way past that. We had just, the, as human beings, we had just basically put a, a beach ball up in space. Sputnik. You know, you look at that. Ooh, that was like a huge major achievement in 57. And all of a sudden, by 61, 62, we supposedly have probes on the way to Venus and Mars, and we haven't even been to the moon yet? And if you listen to the speech, he mentions it, but it's just kind of just, ooh, yeah. you don't even think about it. But I went on a NASA website, or a space website, whatever it was, it was their official mission log, and it shows you. These are all the things that both the United States and Russia, immediately, after whatever they did in Antarctica, the first thing they do is they start sending stuff out to Venus and Mars and start sending high-altitude nuclear bombs up into the sky. Again, if they're trying to avoid a conspiracy, they're not helping with their actions or their, the names that they're using. Um, so, in my opinion, the stage is set for the return of the gods. Have the Watchers been released? Remember I told you they were bound up for 70 generations? That's from Enoch 10, 12 right there. They'll be bound for 70 uh, generations. We were talking about generations earlier. Um, Psalm 90 defines it as a generation of 70 years, 80 if by strength. And if we just take the low number there, 70 times 70, is 4,900 years. 4,900 years away from 3,000 BC, which is when I showed you the time of the Watchers being judged, bound, and buried. 70, uh, 4,900 years from 3,000 B.C. brings you up to the beginning of the 20th century. Is it just a coincidence that we went from horse and buggy and beasts to burdens, basically, for 5,000 years, to all of a sudden planes, trains, automobiles, computers, supposedly sending people to the moon, probes to the farthest reaches of space, all of that in, like, 50 years? Or did we get some help? Maybe due to all the blood sacrifices of two world wars. How many know demons thrive on blood sacrifice? That's why they do it. You know, I put this chart together, and I'm talking, looking at J Daniel 12, 4, talking about knowledge increasing and things of that nature, and showing knowledge of transportation. And, you know, 
at the Tower of Babel, whatever pre-flood knowledge existed got, took a huge hit at the Tower of Babel. Because people who may have been like extremely intelligent together were now barely understanding each other and had to go out trying to figure out their own languages. And, you know, sorry, you know, if you had Tesla in your group, that's great. But, you know, if you got Pee Wee Herman in yours, you know, well, you, you know I'm going to carve pictures in the caves. You know, you know, um, you know knowledge took a nosedive. And that was, the, that was God's plan. It was like, okay, with all this knowledge that you have, this is what you're going to do? You're going to come after me? Fine. I'm going to mess it all up. So knowledge and everything takes a nosedive at the Tower of Babel. And then you have a few peaks and stuff throughout various civilizations. Uh, but it kind of plateaus there as far as transportation and things of that nature until you get to the beginning of the 20th century and then it goes through the roof. Uh, you have the Amalantra workings taking place in uh, March of 1918. Famed occultist Aleister Crowley began a series of magical experiments called the Amalantra workings, in which he is said to have opened a portal to another dimension, allowing an entity, or I would say a demon, named Lamb to enter through it. This is the picture that he drew of that entity in 1918. It's awfully similar to what we would say in pop culture today, uh, Alien Gray, 1918. His disciple, uh, J um, Jack Parsons, you know, with the Amalantra working, supposedly Crowley had figured out how to open dimensional portals to allow these entities in and to close them, according to the literature. Supposedly Crowley's portal was further enlarged by Jet Propulsion Laboratory founder and rocket fuel scientist Jack Parsons and Scientology and Dianetics founder L. Ron Hubbard in March of 1946 at a location that later became known as Area 51. Their experiment was called the Babylon working. Like the Amalantra working, it was based on ceremonial sex magic. Unlike Crowley, however, they were not as adept at opening and closing portals. Theirs apparently stayed open, and the modern UFO era began one year later in 1947, the same year Crowley died. Now here's another clip regarding alien abductions. Modern accounts of sexual encounters with aliens date back to 1957, when a Brazilian farmer claimed he was taken on board a ship and coerced into having sex with a strange looking blonde female with large eyes. One of the most famous and earliest uh, of the modern extraterrestrial uh, abduction reports is the 1957 case of Antonio Villas Boas in, in Brazil. And he claimed that a flying saucer landed uh, in his remote farm. Uh, he was taken aboard. Uh, while he was there, he had a sexual encounter with this extraterrestrial woman. That's one of the first abduction cases, and most interesting because it preceded all the others and wasn't well known until years afterwards. So you can't say that Antonio Villas Boas got these ideas by reading pulp literature. A few years later, in 1961, Betty and Barney Hill of Lancaster, New Hampshire, reported a famous abduction incident where they were placed naked on examination tables and probed by what they described as gray aliens who extracted eggs and sperm samples. Now, this is a field of research that I, that I actually kind of got started with looking into the whole UFO alien thing. Because from a biblical worldview, I'm trying to figure out what, what, what's going on here? What is this? You can't deny this stuff is happening. This is happening more and more. In fact, a friend of mine who just graduated from seminary was thinking about starting his own Bible school, had watched the first season of Ancient Aliens, and he said, Rob, I know you're into this kind of out there weird re research and stuff. He's like, what do we, as Bible-believing Christians, what do we do with this evidence? We can deny the conclusions that they come up with. What do we do? do with, what are we supposed to do with the evidence? We can't deny the evidence. The evidence is there. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I mean, here's a guy who just came, just graduated seminary. He's about to start his own Bible school, and he doesn't have an answer for this. You know, so I, at that time, I actually started having Ancient Aliens Night. I had a studio, and I would just open it up to the public, and we'd come in and watch Ancient Aliens episodes, and I'd talk about it from a biblical worldview. That's how, that's really kind of how I got started. Are you going to hear anything about this in church? You're hearing it every day in the world. The world is hearing it every day. It's being pushed on them through television, cartoons, movies, everywhere you look. And now even into, quote-unquote, mainstream science with Richard Dawkins and people like that saying, ah, it could be, you know, in general, in the seat of the world. If the church isn't talking about it, the, the church is going to be in a whole lot of trouble. Because something's coming. 
you know, I believe it's all part of a great deception. And I begin to wonder if, if that's not part of the fulfillment of Daniel 2, 43, where it says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, who are they, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, and they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. You have this mysterious they mixing themselves with humans. What's going on there? I don't know, but we see when with all these alien abduction things, and more and more of them are happening. Dr. David Jacobs is a guy who started out as a skeptic, but just ended, ended up counseling people who claimed to have been abducted, and they would tell him his story, and it's like, okay, you hear it once, okay, maybe, you know, the dude's crazy. You hear it twice, well, that's an interesting coincidence. You keep hearing it over and over and over again, dozens of people from all around the world telling similar stories that have no interaction with each other, then you got to take notice of it and say something's happening here. And when people are seeing UFO sightings more and more increasing every year, stuff happening, signs, wonders in the sky, it all just feeds into it. And, I, and I'm going, you know, again, is it just a coincidence that books like this start popping up right around the same time? And you got the Roswell thing happening in 47, but you also have that dude throwing a rock in a cave and that pops the book of Enoch and other texts that help to explain. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it's there to help us to, you know, my people perish for lack of knowledge. I say, well, great. What if we get educated? You know, is the stage being set for a return of the Nephilim? Well, you know, I showed this diagram before. I believe that the, the Nephilim that we were dealing with at the time of the flood were created by humans through genetic manipulation, blending species and things of that nature. Uh, and I like to point out that uh, the days of Jared versus the days of Noah, it says in the days of Noah, Yeshua said, the last days would be like. The days of Jared were marked by the mating of angels and humans, whereas the days of Noah were is marked by the creation of animal animal human hybridization that led to the corrupting of all flesh. So if I'm to take his words literally in Matthew 24, 37, all we need to do is turn on the evening news. We're seeing it over and over again, the blending of species. We see transhumanism, I call it the doctrine of devils, basically setting itself up right in line with what you see in Genesis chapter 3 where the serpent says, you shall be as gods. You see in the, in the promises of the serpent, three things, a promise of immortality, a promise that your eyes will be open, you have knowledge and understanding, and you shall be as gods. There's a guy by the name of Professor Nick Bostrom. Who's, he's one of the foremost spokespersons out there for transhumanism. Listen to what he says. Keep those three in mind. Listen to what Professor Nick Bostrom says. What I'm really interested in is to try to understand the bigger picture for humanity, our place in the world and what might lie in store for our species in the future, particularly the way we might use technologies to enhance ourselves or to um, go beyond what we currently think of as our human nature, whether it might be by radically extending the human lifespan through um, solving the problem of aging or increasing our intellectual capacities, improving our memory, or taking control of our own emotional states. Um, I think that we are right now in a transitional phase um, where before the end of this century we will either have gone extinct or we will have most likely taken the step to become what you might call transhumans or posthumans or just very um, enhanced humans that have reached their full potential. The same three promises in the same order. Professor Nick Bostrom, you go to his website, and he's got a graphic here that shows what their plans are. He says the little pink circle there in the left, uh, in, the, uh, in the right corner, uh, is the sensory modalities that's available to humans. What we can see, hear, taste, touch, smell, that's what's available to us. The large gray area, you know, elongated there, is what's accessible to animals. We know that you know bats can have radar and sonar of a dolphin, you know different species of, of animals have different abilities than humans. So that's what's available to, to the animal kingdom. He says, but if we can blend animals and humans, then we might end up with the sensory abilities of this larger orange circle right here. You know, I mean, what kid doesn't want to be Wolverine, right? You know, I mean, we're having that stuff put in our face all the time. We think it's cool and it's entertaining and all that stuff, but I mean, people are seriously considering this stuff, especially in black budget pro you know, projects from DARPA and other things. They are very much concerned with creating super soldiers and things of that nature. And he says, if we keep messing around and doing that stuff, we might end up with a very big yellow one there, and we'll be post-humans. You know, we can blend ourselves with machines and stuff, Terminator, all that kind of good stuff. This is what's happening. OK? 
okay? We can choose to ignore it, pretend it's not there. That's what's happening in the world today. And here's a, a clip, just a little bit, about uh, hybridization. This is from a number of years ago. Way more has happened since I originally put this together. Plans to allow scientists to create embryos that are part human and part animal are set for approval by the official regulator in Britain. These hybrid embryos are seen by the country's leading scientists as a vital step in the search for cures for diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. It's a highly controversial procedure and is banned in some European countries. Our medical correspondent Fergus Walsh has the story. This embryo is part mouse, part cow. In a few months, this Newcastle lab is hoping to create a human-cow hybrid. This is highly complex science, the creation of cytoplasmic hybrids, known as cybrid embryos. The starting point is a cow's egg, which is cut open by a laser. The DNA is sucked out. The next step is to take a human cell, perhaps from a patient with Parkinson's disease, and inject it into the egg. Now this is the crucial point at which an embryo is created because by using an electric shock the hybrid embryo starts growing. The cells subdividing. In reality it's smaller than a pinhead and when it's just six days old the embryo shell is broken open. Inside are stem cells, the body's master cells. The ultimate aim is to reprogram them into any tissue in the body. For example, nerve cells, heart cells, or brain cells. CRISPR. CRISPR is even worse. CRISPR is a newer technology. Look in the CRISPR technology. Okay, that's what's happening. That's what's in our day. And, you know, I was looking into all this at that time, and I saw two books that I had on my bookshelf, or sitting on my desk, actually, arranged in this order. Corrupting the Image by Doug Hamp and Forbidden Gates by Tom and Nita Horn, and I was looking at the, they were arranged in that order, I said, wow, what if that's the formula? Mm -hmm. Corrupting the image that God created and called good of each kind leads to op opening up forbidden gates that brings about the recreation or the return of the Nephilim. I believe that's exactly what's happening, especially if you look in the definition of what uh, the fall, that's where Nephilim comes from, and just look at all that. I mean, no good's going to come from that. And this is why, you know, you're going to have to make your own decisions, but it's getting scarier and scarier to go to hospitals yes. for anything, yeah. you know, short of setting a broken bone or something, maybe. Because uh, as soon as they start getting into genetic stuff and, and vaccines and things of that nature, especially if you're trying to walk in Torah, yeah. uh, you know, I'm of the opinion that we're going to have to really start to walk in and understand what Scripture says anyone not just Peter, James, and John. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I've done and even greater works. I think we're going to have to get that. And, you know, Steve talked about being part of the Pentecostal movement and stuff, and, you know, and I've been associated with some of that too. Um, and I've actually seen people get healed. I've seen people being healed through these hands right here, not because of who I am, but because of who lives inside of me. And, and I know enough about myself that if I have a half a second to think about it, it's not going to work. But I've had those times where I've been in a situation and God will just tap me on the shoulder and say, heal her. And, if, and it's happened a number of times. The times that I think about it and the, yeah, but what if it doesn't work and people are going to, you know, uh -huh. forget it. Doubt is the kryptonite of faith. But the times that I just said, okay, yes, Lord, boom. And it wasn't about praying, oh, Lord, please, if it's your will, please. Heal you. No. Where do you see people doing that in the Bible? You see Peter seeing a dude there say, look, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, get up and walk. You know, you command that thing to go, and it goes. And I've seen that happen, so I believe in it. Mm -hmm. Have I been able to walk in it, you know, steadily? No, absolutely not. But I desire to, and I think a day's coming where we're going to need to, mm -hmm. because it is getting scary out there, mm -hmm. and not just on that side. I mean, corrupting all flesh, you have the com combining of species, but you also have the merging with technology, and you got Time Magazine putting out a, a front cover right there. 2045, the year man becomes immortal. That's their goal. And if you go to 2045.com and read about the strategic 2045 social initiative, you'll see that these people get together every year. Some of the brightest minds in the world get together and discuss technologies and things to get us toward that goal. And it's all about transhumanism.
Amen. blending of species and technologies of cyborgs and stuff. Amen. Which is really interesting when you see a clip like this that was by a U.S. Army general addressing his, uh, some cadets that were in, a, in an army school. If the world of 1916 was complex, or the world of 1945 was complex, the world of 2016 is intensely complex. And I can tell you that from personal experience, and I know there's many others who can tell you that as well. And you will graduate and be in that world, and you're going to be leading the soldiers and the sailors, the airmen and the Marines in that world. You'll be dealing with terrorists. You'll be dealing with hybrid armies. You'll be dealing with little green men. You're going to be dealing with tribes. You'll be dealing with national leaders and local leaders. You'll be dealing with politics and economics. And you'll be dealing with direct fire and indirect fire. And you're going to be dealing with it all. And it's all going to be dealt with simultaneously. Now, of course, the official take on that is hybrid armies is talking about standard military operations combined with technology, drones, and different things like that. That's the, sort of the official view of what hybrid army represents, you know, a hybrid of all kinds of different uh, methods. Little Green Men happens to be a reference, they say, to six-foot-tall Russian soldiers that uh, have unmarked green uniforms. That's the official story. Uh, and that may be true. Sure, great, wonderful. What about all this other stuff that I showed you that is really happening? They are really creating hybrids in laboratories, and all of the ancient history says that you're going to end up with ultimate violence if you do that. And little green men, if I ever said to you the phrase, little green men, what's the first thing you think of? Martians. Where's the kaboom? The earth shattering kaboom. <laughs> little green men is a reference to aliens in pop culture. And we have a massive increase in UFO sightings and alien abductions. So he may be saying more truth than most people are willing to accept. Is the stage being set for the return of the beast? I'm going to conclude with this. You know, I'm talking about the return of the watchers that were judge-bound and buried for 70 generations. Is it just a coincidence that what happened in the 20th century? And the return of the Nephilim, is it just a coincidence that we're seeing the hybridization taking place? Well, what about the return of the beast? We're expecting the return of Christ. I believe that there's going to be a return of Antichrist as well. If you remember the names that I had up there, Osiris being one of the references to Nimrod, one of the names he became known by, well, the tomb of Osiris was found in 1999. Dr. Zahi Hawass said, I have found a shaft going 29 meters vertically down into the ground, exactly halfway between the Chevron Pyramid and the Sphinx. At the bottom, which is filled with water, we have found a burial chamber with four pillars. In the middle is a large granite sarcophagus, which I expect to be the grave of Osiris, the god. I've been digging in Egypt's sand for more than 30 years, and up to date, this is the most exciting discovery I have made. This is what they found when they looked at it. This is an artist's rendering of it. The red star is the location between the Pyramid and the Sphinx. And then you came down into a, a, a large chamber, went down again, came down to an area that had seven uh, sarcophagus things, and another tunnel that went down even further, actually six, with a, a seventh one going down. And then you have the artist's depiction on the right there of what they found. Now, the sarcophagus was open. They did find a body inside of it. Uh, everybody that looked at it and studied it did not believe that it was Osiris, but they were thinking that this may be what we might consider to be a resurrection chamber. And so what it appears is that somebody maybe with the hopes of resurrecting, of being resurrected, was loaded into this thing and it didn't work. Uh, but it's a very interesting find. You can look that up, study that for yourself. And in 2003, April 2003, coincidentally one month before we set up the military occupation phase in Iraq, and the first thing our troops did was raid the Museum of Iraq, and 170,000 items were reported stolen. Of those, most of them were, were returned. The ones that were not returned were about 3,000 items that all dealt with resurrection and the afterlife. Probably just a coincidence. That's right after they found the tomb of Gilgamesh. And if the stories are to be believed, the body was found, believed to be Gilgamesh, incredibly well preserved, and the primary objective was to extract DNA. So then we get to a warning from Yeshua in Matthew 24. He says, If any man say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. 
He says, behold, I have told you before. That's King James. Other translations make it sound like, hey, listen up. I'm about to tell you something. Remember what I've told you before? Think about it. If they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert. The body of Gilgamesh was pulled out of the desert in 2003. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. The secret chamber of Osiris was found in 1999. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's what we should be looking for. Those are the real signs. Any other signs pointing to a Christ, forget about it. This is what you need to pay attention to. And then he says, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And I think Steve said, uh, rightly so. There are many different ways people have looked at uh, these passages. Lots of different interpretations. Here's one of mine. Um, when you look into what the occult believes, and again, the Freemasons and the Illuminati and all the secret societies and stuff, the rituals are all revolved around a dying and resurrecting character, in many cases directly associated with Osiris. And Manly P. Hall is one of the most prolific writers of Freemasonry, said, whenever you see an eagle with a point on the back of its head, it's not really an eagle. It's a stylized, conventionalized phoenix. The phoenix is the Banu. It's the dying and resurrecting soul bird of Osiris in the mythology. So I'm at the train station in Washington, D.C., and if you go there and you look up, you'll see the whole top of the train station is lined with pagan gods. There's one that I didn't put in here, but on the left side, the quote sounds like, you know, it sounds like a biblical thing. It says, Behold, I put all things under his feet, and but it's a Zeus. You know, that's not what my scriptures say, but... You know, you look at the stuff, and the whole, that's on the left. When you go to the right, you see this right here. You see two pointy-headed eagles facing in opposite directions, and it says between them, Let all the ends thou aimst at be, thy countries, thy gods, and truths be noble, and the nobleness that lies in other men, sleeping but never dead, will rise in majesty to meet thine own. What is that all about? Well, <clears throat> I got two phoenix eagles right there. I was thinking about my time in the military when I was in the army, I was covered from head to toe with eagles. Eagles on our buttons, eagles on our patches, eagles on our shoes, like eagle, eagles are everywhere, you know, the American eagle. But, you know, Manly P. Hall says there's another meaning behind that. And so while we were looking at all this stuff, I, there was a, something that I wanted to see, and I didn't know where it was. And we're driving down the road, and I looked between two buildings, and I saw two eagles perched atop pillars, one on, e on each pillar through this aisleway, I said, I don't know what that is, but let's go check it out. So I go down there, and this is what we find. A statue, this is in the National Harbor in Washington, D.C. A statue of a bearded god coming up out of the National Harbor. And the name of the statue is called the Awakening, which is right underneath the statue of two eagles looking down on it. I don't know, you know, but this stuff is out there. And you got people, again, like Manly P. Hall saying, The dying God shall rise again. The secret room in the house of the hidden places shall be rediscovered. The pyramid, again, shall stand as the ideal emblem of solidarity, inspiration, aspiration, resurrection, and regeneration. This is in the secret teaching of all ages, Manly P. Hall, page 44. We need to know our enemy. I showed a lot of stuff. I'm sorry it went long. Um... I'm hoping that I'm equipping you with at least some things to go look into for yourself. Because if we are to declare the end from the beginning, then I believe everything we need to know about the last days is given from us in the beginning days. If we want to have any understanding of Revelation, we've got to go back to Genesis and work our way forward from there. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.